Um, well, I want to talk with you about personal brands. Okay. And uh, to start out, just a few examples of some personal brands. It's very common for people to use living organisms to represent themselves uh, and, and their brand. And uh, here's a great example, okay? LeBron James, the king, who got a tattoo of a lion on his arm, and then he's had a logo that had a lion in there and recently switched to an LJ crown. We have Shark Tank. And these people, you know, they're fierce. Uh, they're willing to take a bite out of you for roughly about 35% IRR return. Um, one of my other favorites, The Rock. And he literally has arms that are like bigger than my head. And it's almost like they have two arms. He like surgically put two arms in one arm because <laughs> they're just so big. Um, and before you say that a rock is not a living organism, uh, I looked it up on Wikipedia. Live rock. And uh, since Google trusts Wikipedia and everything that comes out of it, I figure I can as well. Um, but this isn't something new. This isn't something that has just been going on uh, recently. People have been using living organisms to represent their personal branding for a very, very long time, thousands of years. Uh, for instance, Jesus Christ, also known as the Lamb of God, holy, pure, sacrificial, um, and can't forget counterpart, Lucifer, serpent, sneaky, uh, you know, deadly. And so this isn't new. It's, it's, the symbology has been used to represent people and the things that they care about or the things that they do for as long as we can remember. And we even do it with those that we love. Um, so next, I've got to show you a wonderful picture here. I was waiting to hear it. It was like, oh, oh. OK, this is my daughter, Liza. Uh, my, our, we, we have three and another one on the way. And um, so Liza. Love her. She's, she's super spunky. And she's got the nickname Liza Bear. And the reason why is because bears are cute and cuddly, but when they are angry or when they're hangry, it's like they will just, just rain down on you with the fire of a thousand suns. And, and so Liza, uh, interesting enough, she goes to time out often for uh, different things. And it became such a joke in our family that I started taking pictures when she would go into timeout. And we call it the timeout chronicles. And uh, here's one of these pictures, OK? As you can see. <laughs> and, and now Liza, I just want to talk about this. So I, I'm really strict when it comes to timeout. When one of my kids is in timeout, they have to sit in the chair. And they can't move, or we're like adding time onto the clock. It's like if they, if they get out of the chair, and so it's always like she's trying to like scoot the chair without getting out of it or trying to climb around. So this was her attempt. She was just done at this point. She just laid back, but she couldn't get out of the chair. So, um, but, you know, <laughs> she got that, that brand, Bear, from, from her father. But I have a question for you. What is your personal brand? What living organism? Uh, represents you? Is it a lion, a tiger, a bear? Oh my. Um, I've thought a lot about this for myself, and it, it's taken me a long time to figure out what mine was. Um, but it's something that it's something that I think can be a big part of you, the way that tag fee potentially is for Moz. All right, and uh, that's this. And it looks like the E came off a little bit, but it's the bristlecone pine. Now, why the bristlecone pine? This isn't the tallest tree. It's definitely not the best looking tree. It don't even produce no fruit, all right? Um, but there's some characteristics about the bristlecone pine that I've really, really, really came to respect. First, it survives where nothing else can in the most rugged terrain imaginable. I mean, it's a rock. It's a tree growing in the middle of a rock, OK? Nothing else grows where bristlecone pines can grow. Next, you have thick bark. 
it's, it's impenetrable from disease, from insects, these different things. And it's just growing that thicker and thicker and thicker and, and just stronger bark all the time. Um, another really interesting thing about the bristlecone pine, it's the oldest living tree on earth. The oldest one is known as Methuselah. And this tree is like 5,000 years old. Imagine that being alive for 5,000 years. Do you know how many dogs have potentially peed on that tree in 5,000 years? I mean, it, it's just it's unfathomable to imagine how long that's been alive. But the thing about this tree in particular that I just absolutely love is this. It never stops growing. It never stops growing. All right, so now it's time for a story. Um, I started my company in, in a pretty rough situation. I had just graduated college. My wife uh, was, was pregnant with our first child, uh, a young boy, and um, I had a good job. I had a pretty good job. It was in door-to-door -door sales, so it wasn't that great of a job. And I was doing door -to -door, I did door-to-door -door sales for a few summers through high school. And then uh, I was going to be moving up within this company. And it was, a, it was really sweet. I could live where I wanted. I would just have to do a little bit of travel for work. But what happened was I decided to quit. And not only did I decide to quit, I decided to start a search marketing company without ever working at one before. And uh, I decided on that pretty much that same day that I quit and, and had the search marketing company, we had made all these plans and, and had worked with a contractor, and we're starting to build a house in Burley, Idaho. Okay, Burley, Idaho, it's a town of 10,000 people. There's more cows in my town than there are people by like a substantial amount, okay? And so a weird place to do this from, but we did it. And when I started, I was cold calling people across Idaho trying to find work, and it was just dismal. Like, I couldn't get anything going. And we were in, you know, it was, it was a tough situation to start from. But though it was hard, I mean, it was like literally, when we talk about the, the bristlecone pine and the growing on rocks, it was like trying to make a rainforest in Mars. I mean, that's how I felt. Uh, but. But over time, I realized something. I just had to keep growing. And I had to grow in my knowledge. I didn't know much. And so I started doing all of these different studies, and I started publishing everything I could find, and I started researching everything I could find, and I started reading all of the top experts, and I started trying to be like them in the way that they would write, and I tried, I tried to learn the way that they would research and the things that they would research. And I started to publish, and people started to notice. And that led to one thing, which led to another thing, which led to another thing. And then you end up on a stage like this. You know, where, was this what I studied in college? No, not much, just a little bit. I had one class that piqued my interest where I, I literally started a website selling Idaho potatoes online. I know that that's ridiculous, but that's what happened. Um, so, so anyhow, the interesting thing is, in my hometown, where it shouldn't have worked, it did. But other people that were like me, you know, these bristle cones, uh, came out of the woodworks. And, and over time, you know, we've, we've been able to establish a good company in this super small town that makes no sense. It's agriculture and a tech company on Main Street, you know, and that's, that's basically what it is. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a few of these stories here. And I want to start out with uh, one, one person that we have named Amador. Okay, now Amador is comes from a family of 10 siblings. And he moved back to Burley, he went to school close by there, and he moved back to, to basically be around his family. I mean, that's a, that's a big responsibility, 10 siblings. And he wanted to be around, he was the oldest of the siblings. So he's living there, what opportunity is there for him? So anyhow, he ends up at Nifty, and, and, and this guy's a bristle cone. All right, and so I know what you're thinking though as you're looking at this, what is that in the background? It's the leg lamp from a Christmas story, okay? Um, so anyways, uh, Amador, back to Amador. He comes into my office and he's like, hi, Mike, and I'm like, hi, Amador. And he's like, how are you? And I say, I'm doing really good. And then he says, I got something I wanna show you. 
And so then he says, I've done some research, and I want to talk to you about this research. And then he spits off these numbers. And i got to read it, because I can't even do it. He's like, we sent 7,189 outreach emails to 2,661 unique email addresses at 1,969 unique colleges and universities. <gasps> We got 582 responses, of which 155 said yes, but we ended up with 549 live links. This is an 8.1 response rate and a 7.64 success rate. Okay, I got through it. Um, and I said, wow. And this is what he was doing with scholarship link building research. He took all of the emails that we sent out over a three-year period, and that's the data that he got out of them. And I said, hey, that's really cool. That's good to know. We've never really looked at that before. And then he said, but that's not what I want to talk to you about. Because as I'm sure some of you in the link building space know, uh, scholarships have been one of these things that's kind of highly debated as, oh, is this a dying tactic? Is Google going to do something about it? I mean, it just what's the case? You know? and, and so uh, he showed me this. He said, no responses have been re increasing over the years. We've gone from 5% in 2014 to 34% in 2015, and in 2016, it's not over, but about 40%. This is showing you the increase in no responses. And those no responses, why are they that way? And so he looked at every single email that we got back across our company and found out why was it? It was too many requests. So congratulations, SEO people. We have absolutely destroyed funding kids through university. <laughs> um, so, so there's just so many companies offering scholarships now, and, and these universities used to be so good about you know, accepting them all, but now they're like, oh, there's just too many of you asking. We don't have enough space, or we don't have enough time to manage this. And, and we thought it was interesting, you know, but then he said, hey, I've got some more things to show you. We also looked at the authority of these links that we've gotten over this time, because it's a substantial amount of links, and it was about 40 average, um, 40 average domain authority in, for high school websites and about a 72 average domain authority for the university websites that we were pulling the links from. And then he said, and the anchor text was also interesting. So he looked at all of this, and it was manual. There wasn't a really good way to gather this out, out of everybody's emails that had been doing outreach and different things. Um, but he looked at the, the URLs and found that 38% were naked URLs. And interesting enough, the next highest was the actual scholarship name. And so then he said, hey, if we're going to keep doing some of these, if some of our clients want to do a scholarship um, program you know, for brand and link and everything else, we've really got to start thinking about the name of that scholarship. But more than that, we need to look at who we're sending it to. And he said, we've, we've tried to send it to personal email addresses at these places. We've tried it to send to more of like a generic, and we found that the generic is much more effective. And as a matter of fact, especially for re-upping like re or reaching out to the same school for a different scholarship, if we have a generic one, 88% uh, versus, versus the personal side. But the most important thing, and something that I think a lot of people have been asking about scholarship link building, at least lately, and especially in the world that I deal in, we do a lot. In, in local search, and, and not just local search. We do a lot with law firms in local search. We have a, a separate brand called Nifty Law, and so a ton of this comes out of there because legal link building is, is a difficult space to be in, um, but you know lawyers have a lot of money, and it's, it's also fairly prestigious for lawyers to offer scholarships, so it's kind of a good marriage. So anyhow, we looked at the impacts of rankings across some of our, rank, our recent ones. And we tie scholarships a lot to like accordions on home pages and different things. So this represents where this scholarship was found. But we looked and we found that the rankings before and after the scholarship in cases where potentially that was the main thing that was going on. Uh, and in almost every single case, we saw fairly significant increases of rankings, not just on scholarship related words, but on whatever were associated with that page. And um, you know, in conjunction with that, here's the organic traffic. And that was a massive increase. Now, of course, organic traffic, you can see that after the scholarship, it tapered off, but nowhere near from where we started. 
Now, how much of that is because people are starting to search for a brand and potentially pushing up you know, other signals from these things? How much is, is, is uh, potentially unrelated to, to just that aspect of the scholarship link? I think there's some things that are hard to tell, but it was really interesting. And so anyhow, he's in my office, he hands us this research, and uh, we just made it available to everybody. And it, it was like a 40-page document that he handed me with just tons of different points. I've just done some of the highlights, so you can look at that here at uh, bit.ly and then scholarship study. Okay. But more so than this, what happened was from this project, we've you know, we, we sat down and as I talked to Amador, I said, how great would it be for everybody to do something like this, you know, in our organization, to just do it, like even though it's hard, even though he didn't have much to work with, it was on his own time, he had to deal with all the client work, I mean, really, he was in a tough spot trying to grow and learn personally. And so we launched something in our company called the Bristlecone Pine Project. And, the, and, and basically, here's what it was. Everybody in the company had to come up with something that they were passionate about and do a, do a project around it and try to improve personally and try to improve our company. So the rest of this is just going through some of these projects. Next up, uh, Ryan. Came into my office one day uh, when I, was, I, I had a newspaper and an SEO company, and you know, he, he, we weren't hiring any, or anything, but he was just a hustler, just really motivated. Came and dropped off his resume, said, give me a call when you're ready type thing. Um, didn't have any experience in the field, but has just learned a ton. And so Ryan did a study across local content, and I, it's a huge study. Uh, I have a link to it at the end, and you can look that up. But um, I'm just showing you a couple things. So one of the things he did that was interesting was he tried to take some of these sub-pages on law firm websites and tie them into an overall uh, page. So for instance, car accident, premise liability, motorcycle accident, lawyer, and tie them all into the personal injury page. Instead of having all of these separate pages, trying to build this content story around all of those things in one page that became you know, pretty heavy on content. Quite, it was, it was you know, 2,333 2, words. And what happened? Quite a few of the keywords stayed the same, none dropped on this specific page, but on a couple different terms, we had massive increases that moved up into some top positions on some very hard uh, terms. And you know, that was a fun study, and he has tons. There's probably about 15 different studies he did across local content um, plays to just see what would happen as he did different tests. But then he took, uh, uh, he took Rand's study on 10x content, and he took Rand's 10 points that, uh, that are basically the top 10 things that something has to have to be 10x content. And then he looked at the top 50 markets in America across four different practice areas in the legal space and just rated companies' content to see what would come up. And we found that about only 28% had from two of the points in Rand's study, so we call it like 2x content because they covered two of those 10 points, uh, to 10. And we didn't even find any, any company that had 10x content, not a, not a single one. Um, And then he looked at ranking terms in associated with those websites and in associated with the page that was ranked from two to 10x content. And you can see in the bottom here uh, across both sides, you know, 2x content uh, had a ton of long tail that was uh, terms that were associated with it. There was no 8x content, no 10x content. But the interesting thing to me was how head term rankings started going up as companies had more and more points, or were that much better and better and better and better than the next piece of content. That's what it took to start getting across some of these head terms and potentially track those links. You can see the whole study at this link, uh, just launched today uh, on our site. Next, we have Chelsea. And Chelsea's a designer at Nifty. And she took a study that we did across local landing pages, um, similar data set, 50 top markets, in, in, uh, in America and looked at four different practice areas, so roughly about 200 different search, search results in legal, which is fairly substanti st substantial across the legal industry, in America at least, and created what it took to have like the best landing page. Okay, so, so right here you can see um, some of the things that were found. So we had things like 
86% of the pages that were ranking in the, in the top position in maps, the top position were home pages compared to sub pages, okay? Makes sense. Uh, we had things like 62% or, or 62 average domain authority across those websites. And then I'll just let this roll, and as, as you can see this, and I'll have a link to this as well, um, but you can see some of the different data points that we found. Um, some of the things I thought were interesting, 75 average Google desktop speed score. Uh, we had 10%, only 10% of the forums, which I, I was surprised it was this much, had like a hard capacha to read, capacha. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different, different data points on here that we found. Um, but Overall, you know, one of the interesting ones was that the average page length was about that 200 and, and uh, or, or sorry, the average amount of links was 2,033, which spoke to a lot of spam in the legal space, unfortunately. But anyhow, um, this data was really interesting. You know, th these were things that we were talking about as we were starting to look at websites. And so you can find that as well, bit.ly local dash landing. We, had, we did a lot around link building because it's always a question, especially in local, it's hard. You know, link building is always going to be hard, but it's, it's been so important, and I think we have a long time of importance left. Uh, so, so another one that we were testing out was internship link building. And this is Jose, Ryan Jose, and really great guy. And he, he looked at a client's site that had an internship offering page and said, you know what, I bet there's a lot of sites and universities that would be interested in linking to this. And so we reached out to some of these universities. He spent three hours doing it, had a 75% success rate, ended up with seven links from really high domain authority websites. You know, super positive. So we were like, hey, could we do this? These were all local universities. Could we take a local um, internship opportunity and scale that, you know, and, and basically go out and like a scholarship thing, the same way, and start asking people in all of these different places. You know, there could be people in other schools that want to move here. So let's see what we can do. So he goes out and he does it. He spends several hours. And, you know, on this one in particular, and we did quite a few, had 5% confirmed approval rate on, on, you know, getting accepted onto these sites or people talking, you know, or saying that they would post a scholar or uh, internship. And then he ended up with 30, 30 applications for this company, which is great. You know, the reason why we did it, what was it? You know, I hate to say it, but how many links? Drum roll, please. You don't really have to drum roll. Um, zero. Wah, wah. Uh, and, and largely speaking, outside of the area, really close by, people were putting them on like a scholarship database that was internal. Like we just get, didn't get anything indexed. But was it still good, especially for a few links? Three hours for seven quality, really quality links in local is very good. All right. Um, so yet again, another really fun study that he did. And not all the studies were, were something that really came out with these awesome, awesome results that we wanted, but we learned a lot from them. Next, Devon. Now Devon is from a town close to Burley. We have more cows than people in Burley. Well, he's from Declo, and Declo has more flies on a single cow than they have people in a town. Okay, and uh, Devon did a competitive link building worksheet that he built out. Now, you know, Moz has a great competitive link tool that basically you can put in competitors and then you can put in your domain name and it will show you the links your competitors have that you don't. Um, but we don't, I, I love Moz and I'm really excited to see how the focus is coming back to SEO uh, and that I think we're gonna see some awesome things, especially with Open Site Explorer in the future. I, I don't know, but I just imagine. Um, and, and, you know, we use a lot of different sets when we look at it. We use OSE, we use Ahrefs, sometimes SEO profiler, uh, Cognitive, Majestic. We use Google Search Console, Link Data. And so this is all the places that we're pulling links from. And so what we wanted was to be able to take all of these different links, put them into a sheet, and come up with a really big competitive list for about five competitors. So he built a, an Excel sheet where we could plug in these five competitors um, you know, get their backlinks, copy and paste the links that we got into a form, uh, in, into, you know, the rows, and then using a really uh, good plugin that is called the, um, 
let's see, remove duplicates plugin, we could gather all of the duplicates out um, from these websites and, you know, following this process, ultimately make a, a really good solid list of the top competitor links that our, our client or, or whoever we were working on did not have. Um, and from that, we ended up getting, you know, two hours, 30 shared, like truly good, um, you know, shared link opportunities, reached out uh, to, to 10 of those that were, you know, exceptional, ended up with four, four really good links. And in local, yet again, for two hours, that's really solid. Um, and we, he, he walks you through the process of exactly how to do that at this, at this post here and makes the sheet usable for you that you can download or make for yourself. Now, Devin was also a, a very key person in creating a list of local link building ideas and, and um, you know, tactics that we did for MozCon Local a little earlier in this year. And I think that that's another important one that if you're, if you're doing any type of link building, and I think whether, you know, Rand did a, did a Whiteboard Friday about this, you know, whether you are in local or you're a national company, local links can be very, very good for you. And so there's some great ideas in here. Um, the caps matter on the, on the L's and the B. Um, so, so yeah, yet again, good studies. Now, um, next we have Cameron, okay? And Cameron works across a, a couple of my different companies. And in, in this case, Cameron spent a couple years learning to speak Spanish uh, and doing some missionary work. And so we use him to do a lot of Spanish research. Um, and, and what he did was he went and he looked at the top 100 US markets in legal and tried to determine what was working for Spanish in the United States, Spanish websites in the United States for law firms. And wanted to understand what the site structures were that were you know, ranking the best, et cetera. And so he gathered this data, and here's what we found. We found that folders, you know, like a subfolder of a site, not a subdomain, not a separate website, but a folder on the website was, was best. Uh, there was more of them, and they ranked higher than any other form of data uh, or of, of style of, of linking, as you can see here. And beyond this, another really, really interesting point was that those sites that marked up in schema in Spanish really outperformed everything else, but it was very, very uncommon to find that. Uh, they, there was, for every 16 English sites that were marked up in Spanish, or in, in English, only one of which were marked up in Spanish as they did that. And so, yet again, these are some really key things that have, have changed and just helped us grow and help their understanding grow of a specific space. Sticking with schema, we had Jonathan. And Jonathan did a schema study across, link, or, or, across reviews. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So as you can see, these are review snippets showing up on organic listings, uh, and it, it was showing either an aggregate of, of stars for multiple reviews or marked up a single review. And so we looked across um, similar data set across these top, top you know, 50 low markets in America and found across uh, 3,700 um, SERP results or, or actual listings, we found 2.7 had rich snippets. Okay, now we've seen as we've done some other studies that these get higher click through rates. And we also see that a lot of people spam it. Um, but we found some other interesting things too. It was always a sub page. It was always on a sub page that these would show up. It wouldn't work on your home page. Um, and so I give some examples of that, like a location-specific page or location service-specific pages because it's representing that. And it, there's, there's some um, language in the Google guidelines around this that basically say we don't want to have overall reviews. We're looking for individual product reviews. Well, in local and for local service businesses, what might their individual product be? Well, maybe personal injury or bicycle accident, or if you're a dentist, it's like implants, et cetera. So different reviews on those different pages would show up, but not on the homepage for the overall company. Um, we found that the average ranking position for those across them all was 4.5. We found that surprisingly, it didn't take too much domain authority. 
29, relatively low, and I was expecting this to be a lot higher in order to achieve that. It was basically like, hey, if you go through the work of marking up the review testimonial, then it'll show up. Um, but now for another story. I'd like to introduce you to Dick Fosbury, okay? Some of you might know who he is, uh, especially since we just had the Olympics recently. Now, Mr. Fosbury, good friend of mine, like to call him Fozzy B. Um, not really, he's not a good friend, I just like calling him Fozzy B. Um, but anyhow, he was the first one to develop what is called the Fosbury flop on a high jump. And that is where they would run up to the bar and jump backwards over. And before that, they would just go and jump and it was like they gyrated over the bar. I don't even know what it looked like, it was just awkward. Like when you watch the old videos of them doing it, they would like jump up and be like, and then they got over the bar somehow, and I didn't understand it, you know? Um, but they couldn't get as high. And so he comes along, and in the Olympics, he just dominates the floor. I mean, he just dominates everybody. And he raised the bar, okay? Well, Google just pulled the Fosbury flop. <laughs> because just recently, like right as this deck was getting turned in, they updated their uh, guidelines around local and reviews and schema. And so I've, I've put together a link that takes you directly to those guidelines. Um, but the basic idea is this. They're saying that now, instead of just being able to mark up anything you want with a schema testimonial or something, you have to have a way for people to leave those reviews on your website and you cannot curate them. So it has to be a true representation, meaning that there needs to be both positive and negative if you're gonna mark those up. You know, you couldn't just block out the negative reviews before you're posting them. Um, so there's some interesting things there. The other one was that you can't mark up third-party reviews. So you couldn't take a review from Yelp and put it on your website and then mark it up and hope that you would achieve the rich uh, schema star showing up. Okay, next, Jamie's review data. Now Jamie, true, true, true countrywoman in our office. Um, she, she was just in our, our rodeo that took place here in August uh, doing a four-wheeler <laughs> barrel racing event and absolutely destroyed everybody, okay? So um, she's, she's also a very, very good SEO. And so anyhow, she did a study around reviews and found this. It, she, she interviewed our clients and then she looked across some other data and then put together some tests, so I'll talk through that. 83% of our clients felt like they were too busy to effectively gather reviews and they wanted help from us, okay? And we offered that, but some of them, you know, we've been offering it for a while, but they, it's, it's still an ongoing thing. So part of this was just getting to our clients and asking the questions. Um, we asked where they wanted reviews from, these clients, and they said, first, Google. You know, this is a client's mindset, Google then industry-specific um, sites. So for instance, in legal, it's Avvo, could be you know, a TripAdvisor, could be something else outside of that in other industries. Then Yelp, and the surprising one that's moving up very, very quickly in local is Facebook. They're starting to really gain reviews very, very, very quickly. And I could potentially see that third and fourth place switching before too long. Um, but another interesting thing was that 78% 78 of, 78 of our clients only wanted reviews if they were five stars, okay? Makes sense, right? They're just like, oh, I don't want reviews if they're not gonna be five stars. Um, but here's the problem, that's not always the case, and according to a study by Bright Local, 92% of people want to read reviews, um, or they will read reviews before choosing a company. And here's what they say about um, the average customer and what they're willing to purchase or do or use a service of based on their star rating. So as you can see here, four star and five star about uh, above 94%, but as you get down to that three star, all of a sudden you're pushing 57%. That's really low, you know, it, as an average. Um, and so I can understand a client saying, hey, we, we only want reviews at five star, our message to them was, well, you know, 94% of people will still use you if you can average around four stars, and pretty much, outside of some of the big, awful companies that are just really bad at customer service and some of the things that Rhea talked about yesterday, um, it's pretty easy for a company, maybe outside of restaurants, to average above four stars, you know, if they're actively managing their online review process. 
And so there's a few really great tools, and, and we wanted to include this as part of our test. So, so Jamie worked with Get Five Stars, which I think is a fantastic tool in the local, the local search review space. And, and here's what we did, and this was interesting. We, we took one of our clients, we sent out 169 requests, we got 11 testimonials out of it, 14 star ratings from it, but zero transition to actually go and leave online reviews. These were just a blind group going out and, and sending the emails to just a client base. Um, and, and that's not, that's not uh, you know, an abnormality. This is, this is fairly normal to not get reviews online if you're just blindly going out and, and sending an email asking a big customer base. Um, but we have a bunch of clients that have done very well with reviews. You can see here 100 reviews for a lawyer on Google, you know, 23, somewhere close to 50, another one around 25. And so it's like, okay, we want to know from these clients, what are you doing? What is getting uh, people to leave these Google reviews for you? This is what it was. They personally reached out to everyone to ask them, either themselves or one of the members in their office before they would send that feedback request using a tool like Get Five Stars. They would just ask. You know? And so that's why at MozCon, what do they do? You have people stand up that say, please go and review the speakers, because it's important for them to get feedback. It means a lot to the event. It helps them push it. It helps them move it forward. It helps them bring uh, better quality. It helps speakers progress and grow. You know? So it's the same process. And, and you have to work it into your business process to just ask every single person. Okay. So that was a great study, and we found out some great things through that. Then we have Roman. Roman moved back. I hired him, um, and, and he, he does a lot of link building. Uh, that's been his focus. And, and Roman moved back because his mom was about to have a baby, and he wanted to help. And he's just about getting ready to go into college to finish his degree. But he was, you know, to get a job at Nifty because he was actually just out of high school, didn't have too much uh, education um, beyond that. But he was super into the space. He loved the idea of programming. He loved these things. So, so we just basically said, hey, if you want to get a, a job here, you have a weekend. You have to build a website and you have to optimize it and then show us what you did. And so he comes back, he's built two websites, you know, and, and, he, and he, he took all these things into consideration. So it was really fun. So anyhow, his study was uh, blogger outreach data. And he wanted to know, hey, what about a spray and pray approach, spray and pray approach about reaching out to companies? Or do we not spray and pray, but do we go and basically do really targeted blogger outreach? And, and test that. So we took you know, 230 outreach attempts across six different clients on average. And here's what we are, that, this, is, this is showing that data here. You know, outreach to 230 websites across these six clients. With Spray and Pray, just the response rate from Spray and Pray, we got 1.5 companies responding to the request to out, uh, with outreach, but only 5% of that 1.5% linked. It's like just awful. I mean, really, that's, that's what that felt like, taking that approach. Um, but it was good to see and actually see data around because I haven't seen too much data around that. Um, but what about when we took a targeted approach? So all of a sudden, we went up from 1.5% to 42% response rate. And of that 42 response rate of everybody that responded, an 18% link rate. All right, that was big, you know, and that, this has been the approach we've taken, but we were wondering, was selective truly the way to go, or do we need to go back to a little more spray and pray? Well, this clearly showed us what we needed to do. <laughs> I mean, clearly. Um, so the last study I want to talk about is, is kind of bringing it back to Nifty itself, and, and that was a study across our reporting that we send out to clients, okay? I've always prided our company on this, on this subject. Um, it's always been a strong point for us. We always do custom, really detailed um, reports that we spend a lot of time on trying to provide analysis and different things with. And uh, so we asked, first off, you know, this. Well, we used a tracking tool to see how many of our clients were opening our reports. It was 90%. But then we went and we asked them, and we found out exactly the same thing. We asked them, were you reading our reports? And it was 90% as well. So they weren't lying to us, which is good for clients to not lie to you. Um, so anyhow, it showed that our data and asking was correct. Um, how much of the report did the client read? 
All of it, only 69%, and it starts going down from there. How often do you have a phone call with one of the managers from the company? Now, in small business, uh, dealing, you know, we have some bigger enterprise clients. A lot of our clients are small business law firms. And so how often did they have a phone call with a nifty project manager? 58. This is something we track every month that we're trying to improve to 100%. But it was interesting to see that and to see some of the reasons why, which was basically small business people don't have time. We would try to make the phone calls. They wouldn't return. They would want to communicate through email, et cetera. Um, but this was the kicker. This one was really hard for us. What was the most useful information in our report? I definitely thought it would be leads. And that was last. And I've been racking my brain, and we've been talking to people about this. And, you know, keyword rankings, we've been trying to downplay that, but that's what they wanted. Um, so it just left me confused. And so we've been trying to figure this out. And, and we've came to a few interesting things. For instance, with leads, um, just something simple that we hadn't thought about was, you know, filtering out uh, certain bad phone calls or filtering out form fills that weren't really that qualified. Uh, in some cases, we had some people that were in our organization and some people that weren't, and we were able to uncover that by looking at that because they were like, yeah, you're giving us leads, but I'm not sure we're totally, totally trusting this data. Or going into Google My Business, um, the dashboard, and pulling the reports out of there and, and having the clients feel like they're not trusting that data. And so we're trying to figure out different ways in, in small business and in local and in service to improve on that and, and to make those things better. Um, but overall, it comes back to this. All of these projects were just hustle projects. They were using grit. You know, it just took, it, it took extra work that we asked people to do, um, but they went and, and they did it, and they really got passionate about it, and they really tried to figure some things out that would help them grow like the bristlecone pine. So I have a challenge. Um, what I challenge you to do is to go out and do your own bristlecone project. You know, you might not be in local. Some of these studies might not be very relevant to you as far as the field that you're in, but one thing that is extremely relevant is that you can continually grow over the course of your life. And the best way to do that is to just tackle something hard. Tackle something that nobody else in your organization wants to. Tackle something that's been perplexing you that just makes it difficult to do what you do and figure out how you can do it better. And I want to hear about it. So share it online and tag it with the bristlecone hashtag. And I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Mike, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Seriously. Um, so. Obvious question, someone said, have you heard anything about Google rolling out a penalty for outdated review schema? Asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about this internally. So if, if somebody has that review schema markup, is Google going to penalize them for not following these new guidelines uh, when they basically raise the bar? My thoughts on that is that most likely they're just not going to show the, the review snippet stars on your listing. That's most likely. Now, could they move that to a penalty? Yes, but um, I'm not speaking from too much experience. Schema penalties are really easy to get out of once you remove that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know. I cannot confirm nor deny that, but I've heard from somebody. How about, uh, so for the projects themselves, like, did you decide the topics, or did they pick them personally, or how, how did that work? They, they picked them personally. They, they, we just went, so we basically gave people a week to come up with their project. They came back. Uh, we gave feedback, so one of the big parts of this was everybody pitched their project um, in, in a team of about three or four people, and then they just tried to f you know, refine that and come up with some of the interesting angles uh, that would just push those projects to go beyond. And even Amador, when he first brought back his research and showed me, I talked him through some ways that that could potentially get better as well, and I, I just think that that feedback is super important. The same way as like, you know, get five stars asking for feedback that improves the business, or MozCon asking for feedback. So. And how did you prote protect their time? Like, like, making sure they didn't spend too much, or? or it, was, you know, it, was uh, it was a lot. It was, I, we didn't. It was up to everybody to spend time. It, it definitely, in 
in nifty project time, it cost us a lot of internal money to do that, which to me was really great for the experience that it was. Um, but a lot of people put in it after hours. They just, they just did it because they were passionate, especially Amador starting initially. It was just extra time. That's awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. Mike.